So, uh, looks like you guys signed up for a class called How Things Work. I hope that's what you signed up for, because that's what you're sitting in right now. Uh, I think that's a great name for a class. If you think about it, probably, probably all the classes you take, if you think about it, could be called How Things Work. Uh, as you go about the university, that's pretty much what we do here at UVA. It's pretty much what most universities are in the, in the job of doing, is trying to figure out how things work. If you go down, uh, I don't know, there's probably somebody right now trying to figure out how societies work, how cultures work, how religion works. There's someone trying to figure out how the human brain works. I think the creative writing department, the physics department, the biology department, the religion department are all trying to figure out how the human brain works. That's a good field of study. Um, yeah, right now as we speak, some in, in some basement somewhere, there's some grad student trying to figure out some mystery of how acorns work or something, I don't know. Uh, maybe sometime in the next few days, grab someone on the side, around grounds, grounds, grab somebody who looks like a grad student or a professor and say, what are you doing? And they'd say, ah, oh, I just got back from a trip to Borneo, I'm trying to figure out how turtles work or something. We're always trying to figure out how stuff works. That's kind of what humans do. I think as long as there have been humans, there have been humans looking at each other, looking at the sky, looking at the world around them, the complexity they see, and going, I wonder how that works. And so I think that's a good thing to do, and I think you're going to spend all of your UVA years hopefully puzzling through some version of that question, how does stuff work? Uh, here in the physics department, so you actually are in the physics building, this is physics, what, 203? In the physics building, that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out how things work. Now, Physicists have a unique way of going about that question. Um, I think when you go around grounds, everyone's kind of doing it their own way. And I think it's important to note that when, I don't know, the creative writing department takes a stab at how things work, they're going to come up with an answer that is going to help inform the human experience that is not necessarily in competition to another answer to the question of how things work. And so I think that's an important way to start is with the knowledge that here in the physics building, we're trying to figure out how things work. And across the street over in the engineering department, or in the engineering buildings, they're trying to figure out how things work. Behind me or in front of me, I don't have a sense of direction. Somewhere the Curry School is trying to figure out how to do this thing called school. Uh, I hope they make some progress. Um, wherever politics is studied, that's not working. They should figure that out. Uh, I would love to know. Some, somebody needs to make a big discovery there. There needs to be like a Isaac Newton of politics to figure that whole thing out. Um, but so as, as these various schools are trying to figure out how things work, we're, we're not in competition with one another. My claims to the answers there are not exclusive to another. In fact, I think you're at a university, meaning whole. I think a whole answer to that question involves the religion department, and the politics department, and the education department, and the physics department. So these, these, these answers are not in competition with one another. They're not mutually exclusive. Another thing that I think worth noting, if you were to walk around grounds from department to department, you almost never see a department packing up their stuff going, good job, guys. We did it. We now, how now, we now know how stuff works. Like, acorns are not a mystery anymore. I think that's one of the nice things about the fields of study that any of us are engaged in. I doubt, m I don't think many of us here in this room are physics majors. Whatever field of study you're in, chances are it's not wrapping up anytime soon. That these, any field we're studying is alive, is uh, constantly evolving, and is going to constantly involve new studies and new, new questions. Uh, physics is no different. In fact, uh, physics is, the history of physics largely is the feel almost getting to that point where they're starting to feel like, yeah, we kind of got this universe thing figured out. And then an Einstein or somebody comes along and just flips everything upside down and we got to kind of start from scratch. Or at least when we answer some big nagging question in physics, it usually opens up like 50 other questions. Like, oh great, we figured out gravity. Now, what is gravity anyway? Now we got 20 more questions. So that's kind of um, how the physics department works. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, yeah, how, how we do how the, fi the, the physics way of looking at the world. Um, like I said, it's not in competition in these other ways, but there are certain bounds uh, around how we do it. Um, here in the physics department, we want to look at the world. We want to ask the question how things work in a quantitative way, in a way that 
maybe can be proven by experiment in a way that can be repeated and importantly in a way that can be described mathematically and so as we go about the world we ask the question how do things work we want to know if there are any kind of mathematical laws that undergird this thing we call the universe that we're trying to figure out how it works now maybe right off the bat I should say we're not physics majors so that math won't show up in this class but just know underneath all of what we're going to talk about this semester there's some math and sometimes the math is simple as f equals ma but sometimes the math is the psi symbol and a parentheses and 14 things and another and then equals and then some Greek symbols underneath and some other Greek symbols. And, but it, but the whole, either, in either case, that's physicists looking at the world and trying to find if there are any predictable, sometimes described as elegant laws that describe this, the world we see. Okay. So let's see. That's... That's what we're going to do in this class for this whole semester. Is we're going to look at the world and we're going to wonder uh, how things work and we're going to look at it from a, from a physics standpoint. Um, at the risk of bookending any of this, because I don't want to bookend it, uh, here's two bookends. Um, here's two books, or publications anyway, papers that could serve as bookends. And here's why I want to bring these two up. As I said, for the, I think as long as there have been humans, we've been trying to figure out how things work. And we've made some progress for, at the beginning. Um, but for a, lot of, for a good chunk of our history, the answers were, I don't know, the sun is carried across the sky on a chariot. OK. I got no way to disprove you there, so sure, I'll buy that. Uh, now, not, not to totally discount uh, the Greeks, there was a guy um, named Democritus around 400 BC who figured out something um, pretty smart. This guy Democritus was thinking about uh, the world and how it works and he thought here's one way I can figure out how the world works. If I could just figure out what everyone's, everything's made of, that would be progress. If I, could, if I could pick up a rock and just figure out what is that stuff? Is it related to my stuff? Is it related to the stuff of the stars? What is that stuff? That would be progress, right? Like we, that's one of the things physicists want to know is we want to know what is this stuff? What are tables made of? I want to know that. And so Democritus is thinking that through. And he says, okay, I don't picture an apple or something. I don't know if they had apples in the round then, but uh, some fruit of some sort. Picture an apple. Cut it in half, you have half an apple. Cut that in half, you have a quarter of an apple, an eighth, and a sixteenth, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, you're going to get to something that is either a core apple bit, you know, a, a fundamental apple bit. This is, this is apple at its essence. You can't go any, more, any smaller than that. It's just a piece of apple and you can't break up of that. Or you're going to get down to something that chops in half and you no longer have apple anymore. You have some substructure within apple. But the idea 400 BC, Democritus, was you're eventually going to get to something indivisible. In Greek, a meaning not, tom meaning cut, and atom means indivisible. So atomic theory is old. And that's something we haven't thrown out yet. That actually, that theory, the idea that something could be atom, indivisible, has brought us eh, pretty far. Things have gotten a little hairier, a little cloudier in the last century, but that got us, the idea of atomic theory got us pretty far. So when you take chemistry, that's kind of what you're studying, is you're studying, okay, all this complexity we see around us, people in classrooms and puppies, are all made of chemicals. We've got hydrogen, helium, lithium, etc. And those, those, are my, those are my atoms. Now, it turns out here in the physics department, we don't, the story doesn't end there. And we want to know, are those made of things? And I think we know atoms are made of things. There's electrons and things like that inside. So humans did OK for a while. Then there's this big like 2,000 year gap where um, not a ton of scientific progress. And the reason for that is actually uh, not, we weren't like, we didn't, it's not like we didn't care or we weren't capable. We actually had to develop uh, a philosophy that required scientific rigor or even understood what it meant to be scientific about something. And so when we looked at the universe said, that's probably fire, earth, water, and air. All right, great, moving on. We needed, that needed to be testable. And we needed to have a scientific mind. And there was really a philosophical advancement that had to occur before we could even make a whole lot of progress. Um, and we had to have the tools to be able to study. So. I'm going to skip forward like 2,000 years. And this class is going to kind of merge in to that 
long human history. We're going to emerge into that story around 1686. Newton was not the only smart guy of his time. He was not the only empiricist of his time. He was not the only determinist of his time. But eh, he's just a somewhat arbitrary good guy to start with. And not just totally arbitrary. He came up with some laws that he wrote down in uh, his Principia, Principia, not a Latin scholar, uh, that really are going to get us started in this class. So he's a good place to start. And, and as I said, I don't want to bookend it, but uh, the reason I want to bring up this other paper, so we still write, we don't write in Latin anymore, and we write A4 sized and Times New Roman, but it's similar in the, the idea. And the, both of those papers, one written in 1686, one written in 2012, both those papers are going, guys, 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 guys I think I figured something out. Here it is, and it's some math telling you some something that I think I figured out about the world works. And one thing that's cool about both these papers also, they actually deal with uh, a lot of the same subject. And so it's, I think it's cool that for 350 years or however long or between those two papers, we are still thinking about the same stuff. We're still trying to figure out some of the same um, questions, how things work. We're, we figured some stuff out. We still got other things to figure out. Um, so. But in, here's, here's, in 2012, it's the same, we're still, this is physicists' latest stab at how things work, and we've got a lot further to go. So the main reason I want to put it up there, not that it's, you know, we've ended anything, there's not a closing of any chapter, well, maybe a sub-chapter we close on that paper, but that just opened up 20 new chapters. So you may have heard about the Higgs boson, big deal, 2012. I'm sure you all stayed up, watched the webcast from Geneva Live. January, uh, July 4th. It was great. And uh, it was kind of a closing of some sub-chapter, but really, so it was the, the two main experiments. Uh, this paper is from Atlas. Yeah. Uh, so the guys from Atlas stood up in front of the whole entire physics community. Everyone watching live on this webcast said, we figured it out, and it's blank. And now we got that sweet. We were looking for that for like 60 years, but now we have like 80 more questions uh, that this opened. So that's, the, that's how physics kind of works. So here's two papers explaining, or at least taking a stab at how things work. They will serve as a guidepost for this class. Um, I think, like I said, we're going to kind of merge in with Newton, because he gives us some really important insights that, it, that it's important we get. Uh, but I, I kind of want to, I don't want to wait till the end of the semester. So if you look at the syllabus, I think I wrote modern physics for like the last four five lectures or something like that. Um, it's exciting stuff. So if anyone ever has a question, I'm fine just to talk about it now. We can talk about the Higgs boson or whatever you want, because it's all cool stuff. I have no intention to go linearly through history starting in 1686 up to 2016. So we can kind of do whatever we want. Okay. I kind of want to jump right into it, but uh, I know, well, <laughs> I see enough Apple logos that we got to talk some logistics. Uh, let's talk some logistics for this class. Here goes. Let's talk about technology. Had to do it. Um, ah, man. Uh, I love my laptop. I love my phone. I, it got me through grad school. It really did. Uh, there were certain classes where I needed to write down verbatim as much of the words coming out of my professor's head because on the midterm paper, uh, I needed to get back some of those phrases that he or she said. Uh, this isn't one of those classes where I don't think I'm going to say anything that you need to reproduce in the midterm verbatim. The midterms are multiple choice, so it's written verbatim if, you, if, if necessary. Um, so I think the, the way this class if I, were, if I were sitting in your seat, I, well, I, I, used, I did sit in your seat. I took this class. Uh, if, when I was sitting in your seat, I don't even know if there were laptops, but um, this is the way this class works. This is the way the learning works is that uh, it, for this class, it's fully conceptual. And so it's important that you are thinking and processing and hopefully questioning the concepts that we talk about. So the fact that Newton published that paper in 1686, not important. I don't even, I mean, maybe the century, if you could get the century right, it would be nice. But really, the concept there is there were some scientists a few hundred years ago that started thinking about this stuff. And 
what year they published and what their names were is not important. So you should be, this class is about learning the concepts. And so today, I think we might get to one concept. And so you could get your laptop out now and go, mass, and then close it. That's like the only real concept that we're going to talk about today. Um, so however you need to learn, I support you. And if you need to learn with a laptop in front of you, fine. I'm not going to scale up the steps to see why your laptop's out. I, I will say this. I, there's 236 of you, and this is a large lecture hall that tends to make you think this is impersonal. I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with 236 people right now. I think of it that way. And I would love to know all of you by the end of the year. I already know two of you. And I started looking at pictures today. I only made it through the A's. There's 10 A's. Abrams. I, you start with an A, I think. I, um, yeah, so. Um, uh, but, you know, so if your name starts with Z, you've got 26 days to not even show up. I won't notice. But then I'll know, where is Zanzibar? He was supposed to be here. Um, so, yeah, however you learn, uh, go for it. I'm not going to come look at what's on your screen. Just a couple things I will note. Um, it's 2016. We're going to have to figure this whole technology thing out. You're in college. Now would be a good time to start. Uh, learning how to deal with your technology and use technology to enhance your life. Um, I'm sure none of you in this room were those people I saw at Boylan Heights last Friday, just all on a table, no one talking to each other, all just taking pictures of food and, and selfies and then post and then Instagram or something. Like, uh, let's try, let, let's just, I just, here's my one pitch to you guys. It'll probably be the last one all year. Try to not do that. That's just not living and it's not education. So if you have your laptop out right now, I am just going to trust that you're using it for good. Um, it's weird. Like, I mean, the first, like five rows behind you, the guy's going, I think they're on Reddit. I'm going to try to read that. And so you're distracting like five rows behind you if, if, you're, if you're on Reddit, I'm sure. Or especially if you're on, you know, looking at pictures of cats, whatever, there's going to, everyone's going to, you're going to distract people. So don't do that. Same with cell phones. You can, I mean, if, if you have your cell phone out and you just need to text someone, uh, I don't know what you need to text in the middle of physics class, but whatever. I'm not going to jump on you. I'm not going to, I don't know what, the, I don't need, it's college. I don't even know what repercussion I could, I'm not going to like come confiscated or something. So um, there it is. Please be good. This is a, I think a really fun class. And oh yeah, here's my last pitch. If you're not a physics major, and if you're going to go write the next great novel or screenplay, or you're going to go get involved in politics or economics, no matter what you're doing, the better you understand the world, the better you're going to be as a citizen. And so pay attention in this class. It's going to make you a better citizen, I swear. Uh, the more people that can be engaged in the world, looking, walking around the world, A, curious and fascinated by the world, that's, I think, pretty important. And then also just not being totally ignorant of science, I think, is probably going to make us better citizens. So there's my last pitch. If you want to be on Facebook till the midterm, I, I can't stop you. Okay. Um, someone talked me into this eye clicker thing. So we're going to... I just, just shook your head. Uh, um, so it's all, here's the thing. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a iClicker app, so it's only ten bucks to sign up for like uh, I think six months or something. I can't make you get an iClicker, but it is like a small portion of your grade is your attendance, and so I don't know. I, I'm what I was told. I hope this is true that enough other classes are using iClickers. It's not a it's not a total sunk cost of what is it forty five bucks or something, fifty five bucks. So I hope. You'll get some. I hope it'll help you in some way that you'll be more engaged in this class because you'll be clicking, uh, or you'll use it in another class, or you'll sell it and use the app. I don't know. So we're gonna use iClickers for attendance. I think they'll be. It'll be fun. Yes, sir. You do not. Um, what you'll do is now. Here's the trick I haven't figured out yet. 
is you'll sign, you'll 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 fire up the app and then it'll, you'll say I go to UVA and it'll say here's the classes and then you'll sit, you'll click how things work. I think you'll also have to make an account. Yeah, that's how it works. You'll have to make an account so then I'll see so and so was here today. They clicked. They they voted. So um, maybe we could even somebody could try that today and see what works. Uh, maybe I'll try it for my phone. Um, good question. Yes. That, let's see, how do you do that? Um, I give you, on Colab? Yeah, I think there's a, I click a link on Colab. I think you can, one of the tabs on the side, you can click I clicker. and I think I have like a, an ID or something. Yeah. We're gonna test those out in a second. Okay, let's see, lecture. Okay, um, lecture, the course course materials. So uh, like I said, the, the iClicker thing was a little bit of a gamble for me. And so in order to try to save you a few bucks, I made the book optional. Um, the book's great and it'll cover, uh, I think, everything we're going to talk about in this class. But I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, you have to have memorized this chapter or anything like that. So if you're here and participating, you're going to do well in the homework and you're going to do well in the midterm. Uh, buy the book as supplemental material, but you don't have to buy it. Um, and this other, in terms of other grades, uh, let's see, it's pretty straightforward. Two midterms, a final, attendance, and homework. There's 10 homework assignments. The first one is due tomorrow. It's not graded. I just need, it's just a test to see if you've figured out the whole Wiley Plus system. And so you'll, you'll sign up for a Wiley Plus account, and you'll answer all 10 questions. You can just hit A for all 10. I don't care. Um, just, just so I know you're in, and it's working. Cool. Um, finally. The only, thing I, the only reason I put me up here is I just need you to know one thing, and that is I want to know all two, 236 of you. I have another gig that I'm going to be showing up here like at 12.59 most days and then um, getting out of here at 1.51. And so I want, to, I want to answer questions. I want to talk to you. I want to meet everyone. Uh, that sh should be either office hours or email. I just can't hang around after class. I got to I gotta get. Um, so that's the only thing I wanted to share about that. So um, sorry that I can't hang. So the, the good news is I don't have a real, like, the, the, I put a syllabus online. That pace that I, the stuff I want to get through, it's totally flexible. So if you have a question, don't hang out. Don't wait till 150 and try to get it in. Ask it during class. You probably already know this, that if, I mean, everyone here got into UVA, I think. So they're all smart. And so if you have a question, ask it. Chances are everyone else is wondering the same thing, or it'll send us on some tangent that's worth talking about anyway. So um, that w your best time to ask questions is not before or after class. Okay. Let's test out this eye clicker thing. Um, so uh, here's how I think, oh, wait, I, I forgot to fire it up. Pardon? Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, I'm, this is just a test. You what? For the class? Totally fine. Oh, so you should still be able to find the class on the app, though, I think. Oh, by the way, that's hopefully the only clip art you'll see all year. That's a joke. I, that's, that's not this class. Okay. All right. Start new iClicker session. Okay, so I think what's happening right now is I think it's accepting uh, answers. So if you have an eye clicker, you can, I think, just, oh, look, I'm getting answers. This is great. I've already gotten 12 people. The question is, how much physics knowledge do you already have? There's four Stephen Hawking's, five Stephen Hawking's in the class, right? Six. That's exciting. Well, good, because I have questions for... 
Dr. Hawking about black holes. All right. Let's watch this one live. Oh, no, I stopped it. Ah, uh, wrong button. Let's do it again. So that was question one. So when I hit go, this will now be question two. All right. Well, somebody jumped in as Stephen Hawking. Oh, and it's all over the place. I should probably move that so you can read. Huh. Where do I put it? You know the question. I've had 70 responses. Uh, let's see if we can. 71, 72, 73. All right. Take another few seconds. Looks like some people are trying the app. Any, anyone have uh, success with the smartphone app? All right. Good. That's that's encouraging. And then the only unknown at this point will be, will I know who you are? Did, did that did that somehow grab your identifying information? All right. It took a year, but I was lost. That seems to be the winner. Yes. Well, yeah. So the question was, uh, if I don't have my eye clicker today, totally fine. I'm going to take attendance every day. I think I'll drop five or six of those anyway. So yeah, you're, you're, you got a bunch of guineas. Yeah, you should be fine. Try to come to class, because that's pretty much where all the content will be. Uh, my slides aren't helpful. I'll, I don't even think I'll put them online. So my slide will be, you know, picture of some clip art or something. So try to come to class. But um, yeah, I understand if you miss five or six in a semester. Yeah, you wouldn't want to miss more. There's 45. You wouldn't want to miss more than 10 percent. Try to miss less than four and a half, fewer than four and a half classes. Less than that. All right, that's. We've had 89 responses. I'm going to stop it. There it is. OK. Um, why were you lost? That, well, that's why you're not physics majors, right? Um, I'm, that's great. So here, here maybe, this, maybe this semester we can clear up some of those things that made you feel that way in high school. You left high school going, ah, physics, that's not for me. Not true. We're going to clear some of that stuff up. So let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll start talking about how things work. All right. I, I've, ah, I've already lost people into their phones. Oh, what are you going to do? OK. All right. So like I said, Somewhat arbitrary to start with Newton, but he does give us some important insights that we give him credit for. We call them Newton's laws. Here's page 12 of his book. Page 12, he says, hey guys, guess what? I think there are axioms or laws that govern motion. That's what Newton is saying. Newton is saying, guess what, guys? I figured out something. This isn't the whole picture. But I think I figured out there are axioms or laws of motion, which is a big statement. It's a big statement today, but especially back then, that's a big statement. Let's talk about a little bit why that's a big statement. First of all, to claim that why stuff moves is governed by natural laws is somewhat new. So I want to know why that rock just rolled down the hill. I just watched a rock roll down the hill. Why did it do that? If I'm in 1686, a good answer is that's just in the rock's nature. The rock was made to do that. It is inherent in its being. And it just, it was, that was the rock exhibiting its rockiness, was doing that. That's a fine answer in 1686. Or, the rock chose to be at the bottom of that hill. The rock wanted to be that down at the bottom of the hill. It had some sort of volition or agency, and it did its thing. Or the rock gods were, <laughs> like Megadeth, were, uh, were, were involved somehow. But 
Newton's coming along saying, no, there's actually just mathematical laws that will just predict that. that we, we live in a deterministic universe that just describes stuff, does that stuff like that due to laws of inherent laws of nature. A couple other things that are, I think, um, significant about that. There's my phone distracting me. A um, couple other things that are significant about that statement. Also, what Newton is saying, and nowhere in there does Newton say, these are laws of motion on Earth of inanimate objects. He just says these are laws of motion. And so sort of inherent in that statement is the statement that rocks follow the same laws that people do. So mortals and inanimate objects follow the same laws, and the celestial realms are bound by those same laws. All that's, He's saying all of those things. He's saying that the, re, the same thing, or I guess we could go to the apple falling from the tree, right? That's the Newton that we all know. Why did that apple fall the, from the tree? The same law that caused that apple to fall from the tree is the law that is determining the m Earth's path around the sun and the moon's path around the Earth. That is a bold statement, that the celestial and the terrestrial realms are not uh, separated by that there are one that it's which is one uni un uni uh, there's that word again universe there's just one universe and that these these are universal laws that's a little bit crazy yeah that's a big deal for him to say that to come along and say I've got these laws they apply everywhere and I figured them out oh that's actually another thing that we humans have access to them is a little bit controversial that sure, there might be laws that govern everything, but the fact that I am I am mortal and able to figure them out and write them down is a little bit controversial. So that's what Newton comes on the scene and says. Um, let's talk today about what's usually called Newton's first law. Again, I don't care about the number. There's three of them. We'll call this the first one. I think it's because it's the first chapter in his book. We could call it the third. A, I don't know. But um, let's talk about what's typically called Newton's first law. And it is stuff is hard to shake. That's what Newton figured out. Got famous for that. Got famous for figuring out that stuff is hard to shake. And that is actually more profound than it, it might seem at first blush. That is actually a pretty profound statement. Here's what Newton is saying by saying Newton, stuff is hard to shake. Let's take this bowling ball. That's, that's a heavy one. Okay, what Newton is saying, I'm going to this is I'm going to have to put this down in a second. Um, what Newton is saying is that the reason this is hard to shake is not be is not because of it's heavy and it's not because of air resistance. It's not because it's a bowling ball and that's inherent in bowling ballness or something. It's the actual stuff that this is made of. Because this is made of matter, period, that makes it difficult to shake. And maybe I should define shake a little better. Here's what I mean by shake. This bowling ball, I think we could consider right now it relatively at rest. It's not going anywhere. It's pretty much not moving. If I want to shake a bowling ball, shaking is actually a pretty complicated physical process. I take something that's not moving. It's stationary. And I get it moving. The bowling ball didn't want to do that. Already, I'm running into Newton's first law. The bowling ball is stationary, and I get it moving. It didn't want to do that. Why? Because something inherent in the nature of the ball itself, not air resistance, not even gravity, which we haven't even talked about yet, not its weight, it's... It, just because it exists, it doesn't want to do that. Here it is at rest, and shaking it requires me to get it going. Then, now it's going. That's not called shaking yet. That's just called pitching a bowling ball. Now that I've got it going, I have to bring it to a rest, and then get it going in the other direction, and bring it to a stop. And then, So doing this is a lot of physics. And what I'm doing is I'm getting it going, slowing it down, bringing it to a stop, getting it going again the other way. That is, the bowling ball doesn't want to do that. Stuff is hard. That's hard for, it's hard to do that. And here's what he says. 
And actually, here's another reason. Um, yeah, so let, let's break that down into kind of the, the two halves of that statement. The two halves of that statement is something at rest would like to stay that way. Something at rest would like to stay that way. It would, its tendency is to stay put if it's already put. So my keys and my phone and all the things on this desk right now, they are at rest and they will tend to stay that way. Now, already, I think Newton should be given some credit for coming up with that. It doesn't sound particularly enlightening. Oh, wow, good job, Newton. You figured out my keys are probably not going anywhere anytime soon. But if you think about it, not often do you see anything stay put forever. Sit here long enough, all the people in here will be gone. Sit here long enough, this, event, this desk will eventually, I guess, fall over in a thousand years or something. If you wind will come along, I don't know, something like, we do not live in a static universe, so it's actually not common to see something just at rest to stay there forever. We tend to see things, balls will roll downhill, apples will fall out of trees, trees will fall over, moon will go across the sky. We live in a, a, a pretty dynamic universe, so for Newton to say, actually, every time you see something move, that is not in its nature. Its nature is to stay put. So that's an important concept. And like I said, it, uh, that may seem too basic. You might be right now going, duh, okay, move on. But w as we talk about why, how stuff works this semester, it's important that we realize, here's, how one, here's one way stuff works. Stuff wants to stay put. And so when we see it not staying put, we can make conclusions about that. So that's an important thing to, to realize. So let's see, here's my, oh, here's the classic physics demo. Um, why don't we try that? So the classic physics day one demo is, uh, the, the whole um, tablecloth trick, right? So um, here's the way you're supposed to do the tablecloth trick. You're supposed to have a wine glass on there that has wine in it, and you're supposed to yank the tablecloth out, and it everything stays put. So I tried it earlier, and I got wine everywhere. So we're going to do it with just the plate. Um, and by the way, that wasn't physics' fault. Physics still works. I'm just bad at the trick. So. Um, we're, I'm going to do a nice, safe, I don't even think this is, it might be, yeah, that's not very breakable. Um, so this, this should be pretty safe. I, I hope, I'm either about to demonstrate this thing that, this fork wants to stay put, this plate, I, I think we can see, yeah, this plate wants to stay put, there, you can see it there, this knife and this spoon all want to stay there, that is inherent in their nature, and this tablecloth wants to stay there. Now, I'm going to act on the tablecloth, and so if I act slowly, right, like the, everything should kind of move. You can see the spoon is moving with me. But I, sh I might be able to just get the tablecloth out of the way, and the other things on the, on the table will, in, will demonstrate that, that property. They will uh, show their, their nature of wanting to stay put. So, like I said, this went only okay uh, earlier. Okay. Not bad. Um, this, if, if I was really good, <laughs> yeah, thank, you. Um, thank you for the, thank, thank you for the applause. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a clown or a magician or a monkey. I, I want you to get physics out of any of these things, but they're fun to do. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. But hope, here's the concept. The concept is they kind of stayed put. And the reason for that, that is in their nature. So you can yank a tablecloth out from underneath this stuff because they are, and here's the thing, here's actually what's going on. And here's actually what that other paper I pulled up, the one published in 2012. Here's what we've started to figure out. A fork is a, I mean, it's metal, right? And that metal exists in space. This thing we call space is a thing. And you and I are in it. And I, I mean, that seems... Uh, it takes a second to actually, like, not dismiss that. Of course, yeah, I'm in space. Yeah, I get it. No, you're in it. You're the, there's a medium. You exist as a, a represent as a, you exist as an entity in a medium. And you, because you exist in that medium, your nature is to stay put. You really want to stay put. And so this fork is in a medium. That's what we've actually only figured out in the last few years, is that uh, there's a certain sluggishness that comes along with that. And um, actually, the Latin word for lazy is inert. And so if you took chemistry class, a gas that just is lazy, doesn't want to react with anything, is an inert gas. Objects 
have something called inertia, laziness. They don't want to get going. And so this thing that Newton figured out is called inertia. Inertia is a property of matter, meaning I am happy the way I am. I don't want to change my state. I'm just going to stay put. And so this class is conceptual. Sure, I guess there's going to be some terminology. There's maybe your first and only term of the day. Inertia. Okay, there it is. So this stuff has inertia. It wants to stay put. Let me do my one other thing. We only have like eight minutes left, so I've got to do my one other inertia trick. Um, I failed at this one earlier, too. So... I'm failing at just getting the pencil on there. Okay, so I have a you know, putt-putt pencil on a wooden hoop that's uh, balanced on top of uh, a Coke bottle. And as you can tell by how hard it was for me to do that, it's not connected or anything. So this Coke bottle has inertia. It wants to stay put. This hoop has inertia. It wants to stay put. This pencil, same. So I could flick the pencil off or something and everything else would stay put. That's me acting on the pencil and overcoming its inertia, overcoming its tendency to want to stay there. If I, I don't even want, there's like 50% chance it's going to work. Oh, did you see it? Oh, it was so close. It was so close. I'm going to try one more time. Um, I have seven minutes to do this. Okay. I should make someone else do this. Okay. It seems to want to. Hey, okay. Thank you. Um, so there it is. And so a couple cool things about this. Uh, I think it's kind of cool just to watch a pencil. I mean, th that's a pretty small hole. I think it's cool to watch the pencil just fall in there. It seems kind of magic-y. Actually, here's my favorite thing about this demonstration, is this hoop has inertia. And what, what I mean by that is every atom of wood in this hoop wants to stay where it is. So right now, there's a here's this hoop. This wood atom wants to stay right there. This wood atom wants to stay right there. This wood atom wants to stay right there. I actually come along and I grab not the whole hoop as a whole, and it's not perfectly rigid. So what happens when I actually push my hand against this, the hoop, I wish I could do I w One of these days I'm going to get a high-speed camera up here. For a second, the hoop is actually stretched and flattens a little bit, which actually makes it more likely. So if, if, this, per if this hoop were perfectly rigid, I bet I would get more of a twist out of the, the hoop as it left the pencil might give a little spin to the, to the pencil. The fact that the hoop deforms because every hoop molecule I'm not touching wants to stay put, including these over here, it probably deforms a little bit as I'm pulling it out. And that actually, the hoop probably gets out of the way a little bit as I pull it. Especially, chances are I did not pull exactly sideways. Chances are I pulled up a little, a little up or a little down. And that would cause the bottle to move or the pencil to move more. But because chance, I, I'm pretty sure a high-speed camera would validate this, the hoop deformed a little bit for me and kind of flattened and so I could get it out of the way. OK. All right. Um, there's a, so the, the tablecloth and the hoop, two examples of the fact that stuff, is that, is that the norm? Do we pack up like five minutes early? Let's wait one more minute. I'll, I'll stop at 46. I told you, i got to get going, so I'll stop at 46. Um, so the, yeah, so the concept for the day is that's just inherent in, in nature. It's called inertia. It means lazy. Everything wants to stay put. There's two examples. We'll finish the second half of that next class. Is stuff that wants to keep moving.